Welcome to the Live Arc and our series being artsy, in which we conduct conversations on important issues of culture and modernity. My guest today is the renowned theater director and writer, Faisal Alkazi. Uh, Alkazi is at the helm of the urban theater movement, both in his own right and as the son of two important directors, Ibrahim Alkazi and a relative, many other relatives. Our conversation today starts from the release of his very important book, Enter Stage Right. And here is the book, giving a plug for this. Shout out to people to read this book. Um, because this is a retrospective on theater, starting from uh, Bezel's father and mother and other relatives, the Padamsi and the Alkazi family. Uh, I'm going to begin this conversation with a retrospective on what Faisal's views are on theater in India, and we will go on to other important conversations. So Faisal, tell me, what is the takeaway from this family chronicle, uh, both in terms of where you have arrived and in terms of where theater is today in Delhi in particular and India largely? Thanks for a lovely question, Punam. I think one often uses that phrase that if you don't know where you're going to, at least you must know where you're coming from. So I think that need for roots is so crucial in understanding anything to do with our identities or our cultures as people. And for me, writing this book, the memoir, which I got into two and a half years ago on the request of a publisher, was a beautiful moment to travel back into family history and just see and understand what are the roots and beginnings of English language theater in India. And of course, that was through my uncle Sultan Padamsi and the whole Padamsi family, including my mother, who then married my father when she was very young, Ibrahim al -Kazi. And subsequently, my father's moved to Delhi. And it was no longer English language theater because he was working entirely in Hindi. And in Hindi, the beauty was, as we know, in English language theater, Please get translated all the time. So if we access Chekhov or Strindberg or Ibsen or any of the greats, all the Moliers and the Racines of the world, we're really reading and accessing a lot of literature and dramatic literature in translation. So my father brought this sensibility that this is Indian theater as a whole. So whether it was Girish Karnad's Tughlaq or whether it was Sunu Janmajaya by Adhya Rangacharya, both originally written in Kannada, or whether it was Badal Sarkar's place from Bengali, or Tendulkar and El Kunchwa's place from Marathi. It was the first time in the theater scene that subjects were being, plays were being translated immediately and being mounted in Delhi uh, at the National School of Drama. So I think it's very important for me as the next generation theater person to know what these roots are, to acknowledge them, and to understand that that was a search at a moment in time a very important time because the 40s were the big crucible of Indian culture for dance, music, painting, and cinema. Everything was changing because we were all in the throes of the national movement. So what would theater be once the colonial powers had gone? Would it be Indian in a real way? Uh, would we be stepping into a different kind of modernity from the kind of theater being practiced earlier, the Parsi theater companies? So I was looking at all these questions as one does, as in any case, a theater practitioner. And then one sees how it's moved, because that was all something from the 40s, largely to the 90s, so about 50 years. And from the 90s onwards, what is it today? So today, as you know, Punam, it's a wide spectrum of theater that happens. There's some very small, beautiful black box theater seating only 50 people, some doing very experimental kind of work, combining dance, movement, physical theater, a lot of theater in India, as you know, happens actually on the street, very political street theater. A lot happens on the street, but is more ritualistic, like the annual Ram Leela or Samasha or the Bhavai or the Jatra in those ways. Many of them cyclical, coming up every year around uh, Durga Puja and Diwali time. And look, part of it contemporary, both in more informal spaces uh, or just about anywhere. I perform like just about anywhere. And of course, still a lot of it on the proscenium stage. 
So there's a range of theater. There's a huge involvement of young people, particularly in colleges, who are very, very active across India. And many initiatives, even from the Padamsi family, to nurture college theater. Uh, my cousin Kwaza in Bombay, Kwaza Thakur Padamsi, ran something called Thespo for the last 10 years, where basically, uh, I'm sorry, 20 years, where basically all college theater groups get a chance, I think 250, to work with professional theater people and to just sharpen and uh, define their productions better and give it a certain kind of class. And they are encouraged to write original stuff. So the spectrum is huge. I work in one part of it. I work exclusively on uh, ticketed shows. My plays are all ticketed. And that straight away kinds of dictates the kind of audience you get. Uh, I originally, I had done some amount of street theater. I had even taught street theater at Jamia Milia, where I was a lecturer in the MCRC for six years. But at the present, it's mainly this. And mainly my concerns are contemporary. And then also looking back at our own history and pulling threads from there which have resonances for today. So I do a very relevant kind of theater to today. And luckily over the years, over the last 50 years, I've built up um, a good audience, both in Delhi and also okay. when I travel elsewhere. Yep. That is perhaps the most comprehensive uh, <laughs> recap of the last 50 years of theater <laughs> and related arts that I've heard. Thank you for that. Um, I will want to point to some milestones oh. um, because th those were really important and I I'll mention those. One was, uh, you know, Girish Karnar's Tughlaq and its translation into Hindi and its performance uh, in the early 70s. I happened to see the uh, production or a performance uh, at the Purana Kila uh, in a past lifetime, you might say. And the other is the uh, germinal pivotal position that Mohan Rakesh uh, occupied um, in Indian cinema and Hindi Indian theater and Hindi theater in particular. That's right. So uh, let's begin with Tughlaq. Okay. Uh, uh, I didn't understand then uh, in my early 20s, but subsequently have kind of uh, arrived at the political import of a play like Tughlaq, mm -hmm. um, which uh, as you say in your book and as uh, some critics were daring enough to say then, uh, was a critique of the kind of modernity that was ushered in by Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, and in a way it was uh, a very uh, trenchant uh, critique. And even though Nehru was by then dead, uh, that critique was still very uh, potent, let's put it that way. And I want to jump ahead to the present and ask you, would under the present political circumstances, the mindset and the level of the, the, the phase of modernity that we're in today, would a political critique of a very important and larger than life character like Nehru be permissible or even viable in contemporary theater today? I think that's a great question. I think the importance of Tughlaq is that Greece chose to set it in the past, to pick a character from history. I don't know if he'd been as bold as to write a play actually about Nehru uh, a, a few years, five years after he had passed away. Yes. And I think we're still too close as citizens uh, to uh, the mystique, perhaps, of Nehru, uh, what he stood for, and he stands for so many different things, uh, also recently vilified in different ways for some of the policies, but certainly a huge vision, uh, um, amazing uh, level of cultural understanding, very much there in his writings, like uh, the beautiful letters from a father to his daughter and other work as well, Discovery of India for that matter. So I think why Tughlaq as a script gets picked up every year is because it speaks to all ages, just mm -hmm. as Julius Caesar gets done at all times. Mm -hmm. When we do Julius Caesar today, we're not saying this happened in the Roman Empire. We're seeing mm -hmm. the parallels with today are amazing. Mm -hmm. So if we did Julius Caesar today set 
in Hindi and set in India, you would immediately see the referencing would all be very, very clear. We'd see it, you know, very clearly. As it many times, for instance, my uncle Alec Padamsi did it uh, in the 80s in Bombay and Julius Caesar was played by a woman. Okay, so it was, ah. a, it, was a, it was a direct thing on Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, so yeah. Usha Amin played, uh, played Julius Caesar in that play, a woman as Caesar himself. So I think we're still too close to the Nehru story. And we're too, uh, as I feel, we're still too close to partition to still be able to write about it uh, with some degree of, what should I say, objectivity in some kind of way. So it's, I think I understand the relevance of Tughlaq to all ages and all spaces and all cultures for that matter. Uh, a person born before his time, a person trying very innovative things, a person battling forces of religious fundamentalism. I mean, so many questions it throws up. The pretender to the throne, uh, you know, the other image, Aziz and Azam, those characters in Tughlaq. So Tughlaq is very important for that reason. And similarly, as you pointed out with uh, Mohan Rakesh's writing, I think not only in the sphere of dramatic literature, but also as a short story writer, uh, you can pick up something of his and it's as relevant today as it was written in the 50s and 60s. And of course, My every point. year we have an Adi Adure, we have an Ashar Kaigdin. At least those two plays are done every single year and are in the National Festival every year. I'm just doing a production of Adi. I've just started rehearsal. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Look forward to it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my point is not that uh, the distance from history, my point is that theater. Uh, in in Tughlaq or in uh, critiques of uh, Nehru or Ga Mrs. Gandhi uh, was able to mount a political attack on something that was fairly contemporary or just in the yes, recent past, as in the case of Nehru and Tughlaq. Um, yes. You know, he died in '63. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I'm not being clear. Does the political climate today leave even a little modicum of space for such always. mounting always. such political critique? Yes, yes, always. There is always that space. I was well known for it in the emergency with two of the plays that I did. The police came and tapped me on the shoulder after the first two shows and said, we will not grant you permission to do it. And it was Eugene Ionesco's Rhinoceros. Uh, rhinoceros is a theme absurd play where everybody is you know pulled into a certain kind of ideology and thinking and transform themselves literally into rhinoceroses on the stage you find me one man is left and said that i'm not capitulating i'm totally against this kind of herd mentality so the powers that be at that time could see the clear parallel between the emergency years and what was happening and the play like rhinoceros and another play of mine which was really polish called striptease uh, it was a similar thing. Uh, it's two men locked in a room and receive instructions from a woman's hand. And just a few months before the play was mounted, we did it two days after the emergency uh, was, was uh, announced. Uh, it's a woman's hand. And that had just become the Congress symbol. You know what I mean? So everybody yeah. saw it loud and clear in that kind of way. So there's always space for dissent. There is no artist worth his salt who does not dissent. It is essential. If we start kowtowing to any powers in any part of the world, I think that's the end of culture, isn't it? Yeah? Absolutely. So we must Absolutely. always have free voice. So we have never looked for any state sponsorship or any sponsorship at all, because straight away it censors what you want to say and how you want to say it. I'll give an example. I just did, just before the lockdown, I'd run my ninth show of uh, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, okay, as a musical. So big cast, 18 people cast, live singing uh, in it in English. And I finished the show at uh, not a very major metro and a man came up to me and said, this is such an urban natural play. I said, well, if you think Charles Dickens is urban natural, well, that's great. So you can take something like a Charles Dickens play and depending on the social and political circumstances that surround it, it'll have a very different resonance for the audience, won't it? And any that's discerning audience picks it up in a very, very yeah. big country. Yeah. So I don't think everything has got to be direct. 
the questions of history recur all the time with uh, startling uh, resonances. I was just thinking with this Putin's invasion of Ukraine, there was a very famous Soviet play that I'd done uh, perhaps in the early 80s uh, called The Promise by a brilliant Russian playwright, Alexei uh, Arbuzov. And I said, if I just title this Promise in Kiev and do it today, you'll feel it's a story of today. It's three young people surviving in a bombed out landscape. And then 10 years later, and then 10 years later, it's just three characters, a very powerful play, uh, just at the one level of love story, at another level, a very strong political kind of discourse. So we may come up with promise in Kiev before you know it. Well, we look forward to it. Yeah. And I'm very heartened by the fact that your optimism and your political savvy and your courage persist as uh, in contrast to many others that seem to think, and I'm not one of them, they seem to think that dissent uh, under the present circumstances is not possible. So you and I are on the same page. Uh, let me quote from uh, your book, uh, you say, about uh, what you call the six women uh, in your uh, uh, phase of uh, the career. You say, and I quote, to conform is to be unhappy, but to rebel is to die. And you say this in the context of six women characters in six European mm -hmm. plays. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'm adding that, uh, this applied as much to the representation of women in theater as to the women around you, in your family, in your social circle, etc. And that artistic arc that you make between, you know, Ionesco and let's say a figure like your mother um, is, is very daring. We are, however, in a very different phase of the feminist struggle. Yes. And I want to ask you, are the choices that women make in modern India at the same place having to choose between conformity and rebellion? Or has there been some collective progression? I don't want to say, I know that individual women have made that transition or somehow resolved that tension at a huge cost. But would you say that women around us and women on stage are still at that moment of this cardinal choice between conformity and rebellion? Well, I think certainly there has been a huge change. But just yesterday, Punam, I was talking to one of my actresses who at the present is rehearsing just upstairs in my rehearsal space. And she's just played the lead roles in three of my plays. So she just contrasted the part she played in a play I've re recently written on the Mahabharat Devyani. And Devyani is the woman who marries Yayati, the character from the Mahabharat. And Yayati in turn turns to another woman, to Sharmishtha, to you know, be is much more involved with that woman. So a woman from mythology uh, who is cheated upon by her husband and whose first paramour, a kach. Uh, walks away from her. So her dilemma in a mythological sense, and then the same actress had played uh, Mumtaz Mahal in my production of Noor. And Noor is interesting because I picked the two polar characters, aunt and niece. Noor Jahan is a woman who broke from everything and became almost a man in a man's world. She kind of threw away her uh, any kind of uh, femininity and chose to be a man. Uh, in that situation. And many times in the play, people tell her, don't be a man. You can be a woman and you can be powerful. You don't always have to be a man. And by contrast, the niece, Mumtaz Mahal, and unfortunately, all we remember is that she was a great love of Shah Jahan and therefore Taj Mahal, and that she was a mother of 14 children in about 20 years of marriage. So just years of childbearing, which wear anybody out. You know what I mean? In that kind of way. So she talked about that. And at the present, we are rehearsing my play on the relationship between Ravindranath Tagore's sister-in-law, Kadambari Devi, who was his great muse in his growing up years, and Robi himself, Ravindranath himself. So a woman on the cusp, we were talking yesterday, on the cusp of modernity, 
of trying to break with the past, of trying to step into a new definition of women, of trying to articulate, but without at that point having the tools to be able to do it. You know what I mean? So one needs the tools, one needs, so many of my, I mean, all of my plays deal with gender very straight on in a very big way, whether it's Mahashweta Devi's Hazar Chaurasi Ki Ma, or the brilliant Ariel Dorfman play about the rebellion of women in Chile uh, after Pinochet's regime, Absolutely. you know? So uh, many of my plays deal with those dilemmas of women. So of course there is resistance. Uh, is it always successful? No. Is it often successful? Yes. But one has to look for those stories as a director, and then one has to dramatize very often from scratch, you know, from a newspaper report or something. And then one has to present in a way that the dilemmas talked about on the stage are resonant with the people who are there in your audience. That is only relevant if it's relevant to every last person of the audience. So I did a trilogy of, of plays about the changing, perhaps, role of women in Delhi. Uh, from 2004 till about 2015, over nine years. The first one dealt with this whole issue of the Me Too, much before Me Too, but the Me Too dilemma. So this a young woman in a family involved with a man in an office to improve her prospects and then decides one day where it turns sour to press charges of rape on him, you know? So that was one of the stories we did, a play called People Like Us. The second one, very typically called Choices, is a young uh, UN uh, personnel, uh, wo young woman returning to India because she inherits the grandmother's property. And the grandmother has chosen to do away with the in-between generation, the mother. So the mother gets nothing, the granddaughter gets everything. And this grand granddaughter lives and works in New York. And she comes back to quite an old fashioned India uh, in old Delhi in civil lines. And then how she goes for an affair with a married man and decides to have a baby and the repercussions in that society. So again, many questions related to gender uh, in, that, in that particular play. And the third play I thought was most interesting because it's two parallel stories. On one half of the stage, there is a Lajpat Nagar, a very middle-class woman whose husband walks out on her and she makes very good with her life. She doesn't have the tools, but she develops the tools to just move ahead with her life, be very successful, uh, uh, have very nice relationships, lead a very independent kind of life. And the other half of the stage is a very contemporary woman working in a magazine, and she gets into this relationship without realizing that this man is a stalker. So the kind of questions that surround her. And these stories never meet. None of the characters meet. It's alternate scenes. So you're flipping between this middle-aged lady and her search for who she is as a person and this young woman doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. So, so that's kind of like a split screen. Yes, yes, theater, totally, totally On stage, screen. yeah. Wow. yeah. Um, so let's return to uh, Mohan Rakesh. Um, mm, lovely. Uh, Always also, willing to talk. Uh, Absolutely. So... Uh, I, you rightly call Mohan Rakesh the most important playwright of post-independence India, even though his reputation, uh, as we know, rests on just three plays. That's he true. has single-handedly laid the foundation for the definitive form of what you call, and I agree, the well-written play. Would you say that we're still in the Mohan Rakesh mold in playwriting, or has there been some significant evolution? in the form of the play as a written text. Yeah. I'm not talking about its theater productions. Yeah, uh, sure. I think, you know, so much of what we know of drama comes from the word. The word we cannot escape from. So if you know the Greeks, it is the word. If it is Shakespeare, it is the word. If it is Molnir, Ibsen, Strindberg, Chekhov, any of the greats, it is always the word that has the great import and their ability to capture the human condition and the kind of huge philosophical questions that they all raise in all these plays from Sophocles to Chekhov and Tennessee Williams and beyond. So Mohan Rakesh is in that tradition, is in that tradition of being able to construct a brilliantly written play and embody the dilemmas within the characters. Tendulkar, by comparison, why 
done almost no plays of his except for one, uh, Gindhari Vultures, is because it's often uh, one character is espousing the author's point of view. You know, like very often George Bernard Shaw does, that one character is just embodying what the author wants to say, and the dilemma is created to have that argument towards the third act of the play. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't always make for a very good play, in my opinion, at all. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that becomes something that is not very effective. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mohan Rakesh was able, as was Gir Girish Karnad, in some of his writing, not all, uh, Girish unfortunately published everything that he wrote, and they are good and bad plays, you know. So the good plays get done. Atugla Kaurai Yati gets done all the time. His other things, Baked Beans on Toast is very rarely presented as a play because it doesn't have much going on it for it. It's a kind of slice of life through, you know, a kind of arranged marriage situation. Um, so I think Rakesh's theater is important because of its universality. You can place Kalidas and Malika from Asharaka Igden uh, in a contemporary setting. Uh, in the West, uh, you know, young people in a small town, they're moving to the big city and the recognition it brings and the problems and the dilemmas and this young woman pining for him in the rural kind of setting. Or even Adhya Dure, I'm doing it 50 years after it was written. Uh, at the present, I've just begun rehearsals and I thought, should I contemporize it? You know, yes. there's some images in the play, the sun cutting the pictures from a magazine, should I make it into a cell phone or do I find it? And I said, no, let me leave it as a play of 70s mm -hmm. India. It's 1970, hmm. 1970, 1970, that it was first done. And uh, I clearly remember that first production by Om Shiv Puri, directed by him. And uh, it's great to be able to revisit. I played the part myself, the main part, uh, in 1973. All those men, all the many, many, many men. Uh, so I had a big laugh when I looked at the Hindi script the other day. And there I was among the greats with Mohan Agashi on my right, Om Puri on my left. Shaman and Jalan, wow. you know, we all played that role. And they said, oh, my God. And everybody says, you're the cover of the book. I said, yes. Well, I have that <laughs> play long, long, 48 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So again, in that play, Rakesh has captured the dilemma of the woman of today. You know, and again, he's also very relevant because the gender of his play, uh, the way he treats gender is, is very mature, is very complex. Is very yes. nuanced. Whereas yes. in Karnad, you don't see that. You mm. don't see a great nuance in the understanding of women, even in a Nag Mandala or in Haibadan. For me, for okay. me. So he directly okay. asked me one day, actually, here in the same room where I'm talking to you now, that you've never done one of my plays. Your father, <laughs> as you know, helped me establish as a big playwright, and your sister, my sister is a big director, Amal Lana, of yesterday years. But uh, he said, you've never chosen. I don't know how you reply to a thing. So, of course, I laughed it off. Ah, and that was it. But uh, it's never touched me deeply enough. I don't find the emotional core in uh, Girish's writing. I greatly appreciate it and what he's done for Indian theatre. But I find even when I'm reading Adir Dune, I moved to tears in the first 20 minutes of the play, you know. Because he's captured something very real yeah. and yeah. articulated it in a very real way, as in his short stories. Yeah. So many short stories, it's it's just you're just in the moment with him. Now theater is in the moment. Absolutely. Theater has to work right then with the audience yeah. and the actor. You know, you can't reflect yeah. on it and feel, oh, it was very good, or it did this in retrospect, yeah. as with a novel. So yeah. which is why it is how different. To do it. And then Rakesh knew how to do it. And unfortunately, yeah. no major playwrights. Mahesh is very good, El Kunchwar. But again, very plays. I've done uh, two of them. Uh, the ones which are least done, Rat Pushpa I've done, and I've done uh, Dharma Putra. But of course, Vada Chere Bandi is a great play. And I acknowledge that later in that book. I've done a big write on that in the 80s, that just the end of rural India, how well he captured in the trilogy that he wrote. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to switch gears. So uh, I know that you're very committed to uh, activism around uh, 
disability or mm -hmm. as we say differently abled mm -hmm. uh, and you of course remain a central figure in theater so let's conjoin the two and here's my question theater is the arena of the able-bodied mm -hmm. the able-bodied as spectacle and as the embodiment of profound intersubjective meaning making between the actor and the spectator. You've spent so much energy on the discourse of disability or the differently abled. Can you talk about what these two things have done when you combine them in your mind? And what do the rest of us who have not delved so deeply on the subject need to understand about ability, able-bodiedness, and able-bodiedness on stage? Am I making my sense yes, yes, clear? Yes, yes. I think it's a great question, you know, but perhaps I'm from a generation where perhaps as an individual and as a practicing artist, uh, it's always been about a celebration of diversity for me. Uh, people have marked in my last four plays how closely I've dealt with the very poignant situation of the hijra or the eunuch in Indian society, you know, which perhaps is there in the Middle East, but is there nowhere in the West. So whether they're transgender or whether they are cross-dressers, okay. whether they are, you know, the whole spectrum is very great. We have a, a blanket term for them in India, it is hijras. And there is somewhere, there's some religious sanction to it. There's somewhere, there's an acceptance of them. There's somewhere an abhorrence of them. There's somewhere capturing the dilemma of what they are, neither man nor woman, in a way, at, at one kind of a level. So whether it's in dealing with those or different areas of sexuality, homosexuality, lesbianism, which I've tackled in some place, or just the question of disability, okay? I think... Uh, I come from the viewpoint that, though I agree with you, things were written in a context for the able-bodied actor. I would not hesitate to cast somebody in a wheelchair as Hamlet. I would not hesitate. I would not hesitate to do an Oedipus Rex with uh, a chorus which perhaps had people with various kinds of mental or physical uh, disability. You know what I mean? So I am, uh, as they now say, uh, you have to be, I think, uh, when they cast, they say you have to, one is the color free and you have to be uh, ability free also. So I put a blind man on the stage for the last four productions, uh, playing a very central role in them, a young man of 24, hugely talented. I had a play years ago where a disabled person wanted to act. I said, come. He said, you're going to give me some bichara wala role. I said, I'm not a person like that. So I made him the most offensive, misogynistic character in a wheelchair, but with all those very sexist views about women and their bodies and posteriors and busts and everything. And he loved it. He said, you know, I'm like anybody else. I said, of course, you are like anybody else. And why should I just label you or fit you into some kind of a groove? You know, I don't see people like that. And I certainly don't cast in that way. So I cast gender neutral. I very often with kids, the girls want to play the boys' parts and say yes. The boys want to play the girls' parts and say absolutely yes. So constantly we are playing around with many perceived societal roles and how we label and then we stick people into categories. So when I started working with disabled kids, I'll tell you the very first play was in Jepu with a wonderful NGO at the time, Disha. And uh, the play opened to... I had a cast of 115, 85 of them had no speech. Uh, they were wheelchair bound. They would never be able to walk in their lives. They would have a limited lifespan just into their early twenties. And I opened the play with all of them on stage and we turned up their wheelchair. Some were, uh, there were different plants and trees and butterflies and birds and various different things. And I just opened the play like that. And uh, the audience was weeping at the very first show, Punam, and uh, Gayatri Devi, Maharani Gayatri Devi was there. She was the uh, patron of this organization. She said, oh my God, you're so bold that you opened the play like this. You know, you've not given us a minute to breathe. And here are the children having the time of their lives. 
they had yeah. never thought, their parents had never thought they could be center stage. And I think theater beyond a product, it's also the process that is very important. So Absolutely. when we went in to rehearse this play, there was an 11 year old boy who was mentally challenged and I walked with him on the bus and he pulled me into the center of the stage, clutching onto my finger, that Faisal Ankar come here. He said, for the last three years, I've sat in that seat and he pointed to a seat in the auditorium and my brother has been on the stage. And tomorrow I will be on the stage and he will be sitting there. So I understood what he was saying. Yeah. It was so, I mean, it still makes me very emotional to think of that moment. But yeah. the self-affirmation of theater, the self-image improvement, uh, what you think of yourself, how you hold yourself, you carry yourself. You know, when you played the most innocuous parts in school plays, in our growing up years, we remember that. We don't remember the chemistry marks or how we failed in maths for various years. We remember that moment of being on the stage and the agitation yeah. in the audience of being in the spotlight. So to put the disabled person on stage, you're doing it for the disabled person. And you're also doing it for the audience to understand everybody is a performer. Everybody has something to offer you, you know? So I think many companies are not so much in India, but I've seen wonderful work by Theatre of the Deaf in the US and now many people who I work with who are disabled are in acting companies. They just get major roles in, in perhaps uh, a Ben Johnson play, one of my actors was just in uh, Cast Across the World and on Zoom. Uh, so various people are trying different things and hats off to them. I'm totally in appreciation of that, yeah. And hats off to you for uh, taking the person who is only recognized for her disability. Yes, yes. Taking that person out of that uh, uh, eggshell of yeah. disability yeah. and opening up the entire uh, space on the, the stage. The world. Uh, the world. Ap I mean, it, it's li literally the 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 egg cracking and you know taking the person out of the confines of disability. I Absolutely. mean. Just on a, on a personal note, for the last uh, 10 or 12 years, I've been uh, the last vice president for diversity, pluralism, and inclusion at the, you know, major institutions in the US. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I tried to you know, talk about uh, the theater of the oppressed to kind mm -hmm. of uh, take people out of, of a certain role and mm -hmm. make them do a kind of uh, role rehearsal yeah, uh, as a part of significant educational experience. Sure, sure, uh, sure. But what you're trying to do is extremely challenging. It is, yes, yes. Uh, it, it, is not, it does not achieve the desired result many, many times, even if, even if we try very, very hard. Yeah. So but we continue to try, we continue to try. So I've done plays with only right. disabled kids, uh, disabled kids and adults. I've done plays with, you know, able-bodied kids and disabled kids together sharing the same space on the stage. And all of it has worked for me. And what it's doing for that individual child, Punam, is very paramount in my mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. found very supportive audiences, I must say. We've all stood yeah. up, given them standing ovations. Even when the National School of Drama and its National Theatre Festival they invited one of my plays and uh, the kids got a standing ovation from the whole audience wow. at the end wow. of the play. That was so important for them. They're all kids living in slum settings in Delhi and yeah. variety of disabilities. Somebody without any legs who was a wonderful dancer using his hands, you know, yeah. and body rolls and things like that. So it's great yeah. uh, in that yeah. way, yeah. And in talking about disability and ability, uh, you've also made reference to uh, children and children in theater, which mm -hmm. is uh, lead, going to lead to my next question, because mm -hmm. I know that children's theater is a, a passion of yours. Mm -hmm. Tell us why children's theater is important sociologically and psychologically. And uh, I want you to uh, pay special attention to the status of the child in our society, on our stage, and in the context of our educational institutions. Mm. Well, when I work with them. kids, you know, I'm totally process driven. 
So many you mean scripts, by that? Uh, with many scripts with children, I've just got them to come up with the themes that preoccupy them. For instance, when I work with teenagers, I have these wonderful six Hindi words starting with per. Okay? So we've got Pyar, Pesa, Pesha, Parents, Peers, Privacy. Now put any two together and there's a civil war. So the Pesa and the Pyar, <laughs> the Pyar and the Parents, the Pesha and the Parents, the Privacy and the Parent, the peers and the privacy, you know what I mean? So that's just like a little touchstone to get young okay. people then evolving sequences about what's happening in their own lives on these kind of issues, you know? And then from that, we've created scripts and plays and done them. We've done those plays. But in examining these things and talking about themselves, there's a beautiful play I and a colleague uh, wrote called Magic Years just about the adolescent years, how they're really magic years for everybody. And I've done 17 productions of it, uh, maybe in about 22 years, because every school that I go to, they say, let's do magic years, because <laughs> it embodies all the dilemmas of teenagers, from one story is about a boy who loses his father and what that does to him. One story is about a girl who's very popular in school and a lovely dancer, but is academically just not there at all. So different facets of teenage angst are captured in different kinds of ways. And the resonance has been great, whether I've done it in Chennai, I've done it in, where well, haven't I've done it? I've done it in Hyderabad, I've done it in Jaipur, of course, in Delhi, uh, I've done it in Chandigarh, different productions of it. But that's been a great, great uh, one with, with kids, for kids, for teenagers. And also with kids, when we choose to go to the classics, because I think we must always explore the world of the classics. I've done many productions of Tom Sawyer, some of Huckleberry Finn, Prince and the Pauper, just Mark Twain. And then I've done Around the World in 80 Days. I've done many of the Greek myths. I've done Jason and the Argonauts. I've done Ulysses. Uh, I've done the shorter stories from Greek mythology and many Indian stories as well from the Panchatantra. I've done 27 times, you know. So in all of them, I bring it in the context of the contemporary child. Okay, so when we did Alibaba, we said, who are those thieves of today? So the kids mm -hmm. wrote a lovely song about the 40 thieves and they were all corporate crooks. So when you're climbing up the ladder and the other people down below, step on their fingers and press till they definitely let go. This is a song that they wrote, okay? Or when we did, uh, in, uh, sorry, in Alibaba and the 40 thieves, and they said, who's the contemporary Kasim? So they positioned him in Gurgaon. He owns a mall. His daughters all have cars. You know, he's very upwardly mobile. He's very rich compared to Alibaba. So always you have to find what's exciting the child's imagination. And I've worked with kids as young as three and four, and then very big plays. I've done, of course, right up to all the years, right up to kids who are, uh, you know, late teens over there. So it is a process for me. Uh, I'm able to give it very good production values because of my experience and a very strong team. I've done many productions with three, four, five hundred kids. And it's always got to be a gala experience for the child doing it. And so for me, children's theater is about playmaking. And playmaking oh, means you start with a respect for the child. It's not, I've never demonstrated, speak this way, behave this way, do it like this, okay? They play a 60 year old and some doddering way that they've seen in some Hindi serial. And I said, well, I'm 60, do I walk and talk and behave like that, you know? Look at me, they say, no, no, you're very active and you do everything. I said, yeah. So think, what is it who's a 60 year old? Isn't your grandmother? No, no, she's younger. So does she, does she move like this? So always come back to real life as the touchstone. And the child understands it like that, you know what I mean? So you have to speak the child's language and really you have to respect the child. So people who observe me working with kids say, how much respect you show the child? I said, yes, the yeah. child knows everything. We just have yeah. to be listeners, active listeners, and yeah. understand what's going on, what's the dilemma he's dealing with, how does he want to express it, you know? I never have this, that if you play the lead in this play, you'll be in the next play. I say, but then don't act. Give somebody else a chance. So schools, yeah. when I audition, I audition every child. I give every child a role. And some child says, I've never acted. I said, well, you're going to play one of the leads. Oh, but I don't have the skills. I said, no, that's, up. that's me. That's for me to do. 
You have the skills, have to help you discover it within yourself. And kids who say, oh, I've always played the lead, I said, well, don't act this time. Do backstage, do something else, you know? But why? I said, give everybody a chance. It's not about stars. You know, educational systems create stars. They go for debates, they go for plays, they go for elocution, they go for everything. I said, no, not for me. Every child. And often we find in one school, which had a very good uh, special needs department, uh, the autistic kids were great at dancing. So we knew that when we were working with autistic kids, just for them to get that sense of rhythm and doing everything to the tal, to the beat, uh, was great. And the, the special uh, ed person there, she said, it's helped them so much as individuals, you know, just the autistic kids doing these beautiful dance sequences. And, and tapped into something uh, talent that, you know, hmm. we own as with disability, we Absolutely. only see the disability of the autistic child. We don't see the genius see the, that Absolutely. is hidden behind it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah. I'm helped a lot, Punam, because my wife is a very large organization in disability. Yeah. Uh, she had know asked, that. So that's made a lot of difference to my nuanced understanding. And then I've done 30 documentaries with disabled people. So I've worked with every group, orthopedic, blind, hearing impaired, mentally challenged. So I've actually worked and made films with them. So that gave me a very, uh, what should I say, the touchy feely that many people don't get. I've never had fear. I've never had fear about working with anybody, quite frankly, you know? Whether I've worked in a prison with kids, whether I've worked in Kashmir with kids, whether I've worked with children whose parents had been killed by terrorists in Assam, I didn't have that fear. I just went in and accepted them. I said, they are children. The rest is rubbish. First, they're children. For me, they're children. Okay? Yeah. I can't unite them because the, fam the father's been killed. I can unite them because they're children. And because mm. they must have a joyous experience with me. Mm. And I find that um, this understanding of, you know, what does it mean to be a child uh, uh, not enough conversation about that in Absolutely. India, at least in I my circle. Um, no, it, the, child is, the child is always seen as the adult in waiting. Yes, many adults, absolutely. Yeah, and it, that is to rob the child of her childhood because you're putting so much pressure absolutely. and uh, academic or, you know, social pressure or... Uh, um, even parents put immense psychological pressure loose, loose. on children. Uh, I agree. Um, yeah, having been away for many years, when I returned, these are some of the things that uh, 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 I find most glaring. So um, I have not seen a, a child a child actor production of yours. I absolutely must because. So please come like, any uh, Thursday or Saturday evening. Yeah. Either me or one of my colleagues will be working with about fourteen or fifteen kids ages 11 to 15 over here in my house in GK2. You're welcome okay. to just walk in and sit through the session, see how the sessions run and how child-centric we are as a team. Yeah. I would love to do welcome. that. I'm very welcome. close to you. you and yes. Ring the bell yeah. and just come up. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to ask one fairly touchy question towards the no end, but no problem. I, I have no doubt about the fact that you're able to handle it. Um, yeah. I'm going to mention three words. Jan Natya Manch or Janam, you know, who I'm, and what I'm referring to. Yeah. Uh, how do we do politics with art today in a way that it does not lead to the very tragic consequences that happened with Jan Natya Manch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not that they've stopped, they're still very much around. Malashi and other people in the group carry that Sabda's flag forward. Uh, for me, Punam, every artist is political. Every artist is political. Jannatya Manch, because it was a part of a particular party and was espousing those particular themes and concerns in a very beautiful way, very well realized by Saptar, who I knew rather well, and his wife, Malashri, who I worked a lot with. Uh, she'd assisted me on productions. So uh, that's one kind of political theater. But I think political theater takes many different forms. And I must say, everybody sees my own theater uh, being very political, not party politics, 
but raising the questions that are of relevance. I'll tell you where they are saying, uh, Apri, I've dramatized from a Chinese novel, The Dark Road, by Ma Jian, a dissident Chinese writer. It's about those 35 years in China from uh, 1980 to 15, 2015, with the one child policy. And it's about a family of family planning refugees who are running away from the state through China on the Yangtze River, which is completely polluted because they're building that three gorges dam. And this woman is picked up and what they would do with, with pregnant women who are having the second child is they would inject distemper into their stomach to abort the child. And then you could will never give the aborted fetus to the parents to bury or to cremate or whatever. It had to be thrown into a rubbish dump. So that's just the play we're choosing to do at this moment in time in India. So people are going to see this play about China, but the questions in the mind are going to be very different. You know what I mean? Just yes. as I did the French Revolution play two years ago, and everybody knew what I was talking about. Who are the 1%? Who are the 90%, 99%? Okay, what are those questions? I don't have to name names and say it's about Donald Trump and his cohorts or anything. People understand. The metaphor is always more powerful than the realistic message. You know what I mean? The literal, yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to conclude, so I'm going to sort of tie up your projects and my projects. Uh, my larger project is exploring the emergent forms of what I'm calling Indic modernity. Uh, there is a certain tension uh, uh, implicit in the notion of the Indic and the modern, and many people are accusing me of uh, posing a paradox that is not viable. I disagree. Very much there. It is very much there. Yes. Uh, given your pivotal positioning within Indian theater and a culture specifically, and your proximity to artists in other mediums of art, I mean, your book is, you know, like a, a walking encyclopedia of the who's who of all the arts. Uh, Wait for the like... next one, which is called In Search of Sousa. Where I'm oh, really? Different... Yeah, it's almost ready. It's almost done. I'm writing okay. the last section now. Yeah. Okay, so we must do another last... interview on just uh, Sousa, Raza, and Hussein, yeah. or, or yes, yes, you know, that cohort. Sure. Um, so I was saying that uh, no, um, you're, you're, you're positioned in a very important, uh, pivotal uh, role sure. of sure. not just what's going on in your life, but the way that you have your pulse on the culture and important cultural uh, voices and uh, representations in India today. Are you hopeful about the nascent position of Indic modernity or are you not so? I see that you're a hopeful person like me, but uh, 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 there are some very uh, important tensions uh, that exist in modernity today. Uh, would you speak about that? Well, I think the, you know, the very fact that you're an artist in a time like this, and I would just you know, broaden the scope of what you're saying. I think all over the world, the questions are the same. You're faced by a certain kind of government in every part of the world, you know? If people ask sometimes, would one prefer to live somewhere else? I say, it's all the same. It's all the same. And the tensions of really living in a society where perhaps the world has gone beyond the notion of the, nat of the nation state. We're still stuck with those borders and boundaries. And actually, when we're on the net or we're on Zoom or whether we're using Microsoft or Apple or whatever it may be, we are much beyond that as people. As people, my children have grown up with technology. For me, it's been a search. So I think we are on the cusp of a huge change for now. And of course, the artist is always the forerunner in a way, uh, is the person who's leading the way in their own way. All my plays do is ask the question, uh, this has happened to me, has it happened to you too? That is all an artist can hope to ask. I have the questions. I think we have to search collectively for the answers, okay? But I see, and I'm very hopeful because I work with lots of young people and the kind of questions they're raising today about political systems, economic systems, about uh, gender, about environment issues are huge. And 
deeply meaningful. The fact that my son, who grew up in a very uh, sheltered school in South Delhi, eating margarita pizzas and coke, and is now working on the history of epidemics and the manifestation of TB, who does not buy a drink without looking what is the content in it, in the packet, in the fruit juice, when he's you know, doing his stuff. So I see a real questioning at a very deep level, uh, not at a superficial level. This was a son who went into this Occupy Wall Street. He rang me up once from the Brooklyn Bridge saying they're on the verge of being arrested. What do I do? I said, go ahead and get arrested. Don't run away from it. Go through it. We get you a lawyer and things will get done there. You're not going to be in jail forever. But experience that. So we all, I have experienced life at the barricades. And I've made sure that my children and many of the people around me have really dealt with those issues in, in a real way. I've just come back from Kolkata. My wife was researching a wonderful NGO called Ishwar Sankal, which is mentally challenged people who live on the street and they are accessed through the local Panwala, Chaiwala, Sandesh Bhed, you know, Deniwala, and all people who classically we'd call man, okay? How we just concern and care and somebody looking out for them, how there's a turnabout in their self and in the society, in the perception of them, okay? So I think the questioning is very deep at the present in our society. We see it in all our literature. We see it in so much of our journalism. We see it so much in our films, okay? A wonderful comment from 20 years ago when I was in, uh, Indonesia and my travel guide said you're such an open society. I said mine. I constantly feel I'm being censored. He said every <laughs> film you all make makes fun of the corrupt politician and the policeman. <laughs> every film. We can't do it right. in South Asia. You can do it in India. You have that space. And he was right. Can I do that in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Singapore? No chance. You know what I mean? So dissidence is part of our is part of our genetic code as Indians. We are the argumentative Indians of <laughs> You know what I mean? And I think it's great. It's great to have, it's very important to live in a society where that is there. And it's very important to constantly revisit the idea of freedom as an artist. We have to question. We have to raise those questions. And believe you me, people are listening and hungry for a different world. They're hungry for a change and they're looking for answers. And the old answers, the old solutions are not working. So something very different is going to emerge politically yeah. across the world. And we're just yeah. at that moment where it's tremendously uh, disturbing, you know, uh, and that's okay. I feel as a student of history, I studied history in college at St. Stephen's where you were. And I understood that, that the world goes through tumult every 70, 80 years, huge tumult. So we're ready for it's again time. the big journey. It's time. Let's it's journey. Good. Let's journey. It's I'm never frightened of it. I'm never personally frightened. I'm never frightened as a society. I have great hope. And you work with young people. My God, what kind of work they're doing. Very few people of my generation were able to do that. At an emotional yeah. level, at a commitment level, the alternatives they seek, the space they live in, the frugal funds on which they live. I'm amazed. Yeah. I'm the mother of a 24-year-old daughter living in Brooklyn, New York. She's in the forefront of uh, Black Lives Matter because uh, her husband, my husband, uh, who died recently, was an African-American and my daughter is Indian and Black. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, her struggles are more real and more dangerous and more cutting edge and I mean, people like her literally lay down on the streets of New York and Minnesota to right. you know, stop traffic in order to draw right. attention to the issues of race in America. All for it, and, all for it. You uh, must be yeah. such a proud mother. <laughs> I you am. You're very proud. Uh, I, am, yeah, uh, I was far more naive at that age uh, yes. than yes. I, I, I care to divulge. Uh, right. I was uh, kind of more stupid, uh, but not only she, but her entire generation growing up in America and comparably 
my students in India today. I mean, I have yes. a young man uh, in the house right now. I mean, his courage just baffles me. I'm in utter admiration. Absolutely. And it is from there that uh, I draw my yeah. strength and my sense of hope. Uh, I'll conclude with saying that uh, you and I appear to be uh, people of a very similar sensibility. Cut from uh, the same cloth. <laughs> uh, cut out of the same cloth. Not much of it may be spread across the lawns, uh, manicured lawns of St. Stephen's, but indeed, cut off the same cloth. Um, and this has been a most insightful and uh, um, uh, an immensely a huge learning experience from you. I, I hope that we will continue our conversation yes. and that uh, perhaps I might, uh, our learning we'll might meet be... Up. We'll meet up. We'll meet up. Chat. We will we definitely meet up, meet up and this has been a here. very productive uh, conversation. I want to thank you and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thanks, Poonam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.